This video is a continuation of my calculus concept series, and today we're talking about the idea of derivatives. So first I want to talk about what this video is and what it isn't, because if you search on YouTube, there's tons of videos about derivatives. And so I want to kind of put this in its uh, place for you. So we're going to be talking about the idea of what a derivative represents, and the focus is going to be on understanding the ideas behind that concept of the derivative. What we're not going to do is get into formulas and rules for how to actually compute derivatives. We're going to do some computations, as you'll see later, uh, but it's all going to be in service of really understanding the process and, and what when we, when we say the word derivative, what it is that we're actually talking about. So fundamentally, a derivative is about talking about rates of change. So let's pick a specific example. Let's say that you're interested in how the price of a gallon of gas has changed over time. So we could gather data, and you can do this yourself. You can search online and find, you know, over time the price goes up, the price goes down, and you could collect a bunch of data points and you could plot them on a graph. That graph might look something like this. Now, I've just made up these numbers, so if you do do that Googling and find the actual numbers, these might not be the numbers that you find because I just kind of invented this example for the purposes of this video. But you might see a graph, again, that looks like this that has some ups and downs. Now, I've labeled a few points here just because I've labeled some points doesn't mean that the other points in between exist, right? So in between all these points are more data points, right? I didn't label them, but that doesn't mean that they're not there, right? So very often when we see a graph with labeled points, we think, oh, those are the only points that there are. No, there's lots of other points in between. I've just called out a few for you. So just so we understand what we're seeing here, we're going to assume that when I say 2014 here, what I mean is January 1st, 2014. So 2015, January 1st, 2015. So if I looked halfway in between 2014 and 2015, so like right here, right around there, that would be, for example, like June 30th, halfway through the year, 2014, and so on. So all of these data points we might be able to find. We might not think about looking at every single day or even every single time of day, but we could if we wanted to. Okay, so once we have some data points, we might be able to answer questions like, at what rate was the price of gas changing from 2014 to 2017? So essentially what we're looking for is thinking about drawing a line, which I'll draw as a dashed line here, between these two data points. And when we talk about the rate of change, what we're really looking at is the slope. And the slope is the change in y divided by the change in x, vertical change divided by horizontal change. So in this case, the y values are $2.86, 2.86, and $2.74, and the x values are the years. So that's 2017 minus 2014. So the top of my fraction is 0.12, the bottom of my fraction is 3, so I would get 0.04, and the units here would be dollars on the top per year, right? Years on the bottom. So that would be the answer to this question. So if the question is, at what rate was the price of gas changing from 2014 to 2017, the answer based on this data would be 4 cents per year. Okay, and again, that's called an average rate of change because it doesn't show all of the variation in the price of gas from 2014 to 2017. If you look back at that graph, it has a lot of ups and downs that aren't really captured by that single number 0 0.04. So one of the things that we're going to do is think about how do we get a little bit more um, it's kind of instantaneous information so that we get all of those ups and downs, all of that information. And that's what a derivative is going to try to help us answer. But just so you have this, the average rate of change is that formula that we looked at. It's the change in y over the change in x. So up here is a change in y. So f of b and f of a, those are y values. And b minus a on the bottom, that's a change in x. Or sometimes this is called a rise over run. And if you're in a calculus class, you probably know how to find the slope of a line. Hopefully uh, this isn't news to you. OK, so let's ask a different question. So what if we want to know the rate at which the price of gas was changing at midnight on January 1st, 2014, so at a particular instantaneous moment in time? So we don't have two points now, right? So we don't have two data points. We just have one data point, and I want to know the rate at that point. So this is called an instantaneous rate of change. And the problem here is that we don't have two points. We can't use that slope formula that we were just looking at because we need a change in y and we need a change in x. And if we only have a single y and a single x, then we don't have a change. We don't have another point to compare that to. So this presents a problem. So what we can think about doing is zooming in on that point. So if I zoom in on that point on my graph, 
2014, $2.74. If I zoom in far enough, and most functions have this property, it looks kind of like a line. And so what we're essentially doing is looking for the slope of that line. But the same problem is still there. We still need two points to find a slope. So if we only have one point, how in the world am I going to find the slope of that single line? So here's the strategy we're going to use. Again, the idea is we need two points. That's the, so the thing you want to keep in mind here is that we only have one data point, but we really need two. So where are we going to get that second point from? Well, the second point is just going to be some point that's nearby. We're going to, and, and there's different ways to do this, as we'll see. But we can pick a second point that's close to the first point. And the closer together those two points are, the better that slope between those two points will be to an approximate the rate of change that we actually want. So the idea is one of our two points is the point where we actually want the rate of change, and the other point is just some other point that's nearby. Now, when we have the gas example, we're limited in how close together we can make the two points. For example, maybe we only have data that tell us the price of gas once a month in which case the closest together we can get those two points is one month apart. But maybe we have data every day, and then the closest together we can get those two points is one day apart. And maybe if we're really lucky, we have data every hour, right? Because gas prices change during the course of a single day. So, or maybe we have data every minute, or maybe we have data every second, right? But, but we're just sort of limited by how much data we have. So if we don't have data every second, then we certainly can't have the two points be that close together. But when we have an algebraic function, in other words, when we have a formula, we can take those two points to be as close together as we want, right? There's no limitation on how close together those two points can be. And so let's shift to an algebraic example so we can kind of see what our options are. So here's the example we're going to look at for most of the rest of this video. So we're going to look at the function 4x minus x squared, and the point that we're looking at finding the rate of change at is x equals 1. Now there's nothing special about this function. I sort of picked it, uh, you know, arbitrarily. So it's just to illustrate the example here. So what we're about to do is something we could pretty much do for any algebraic function. Okay, so what are we going to do? Well, again, what we're going to do is we have our single point, 1 comma 3. We got that locked in. But now the question is, what's our second point? So the second point is just going to be some other point that's close to the point 1 comma 3. It's got to be point on the graph. So we're going to pick a second x value, and then we're going to plug that x value into our function to get a y value. Then we'll have two y values, two x values. That'll let us figure out a slope. And the closer together we make those two points, the better that slope will be approximating the slope that we actually want. Remember, the slope that we actually want is this line right here, which we call a tangent line. We really want the slope of that line. That's what the graph looks like if we were to zoom in on that point. So the slope of that point, that's the question that we're trying to answer. And we don't know what that answer is yet. OK, so let's pick a point. So I decided to pick x equals 4. Now notice that the green dotted line here, that's what we call a secant line. So whenever you take two points on a curve and you draw a line connecting them, the name for that is a secant line. What we're really looking for, though, and I drew this on the previous slide, but this right here, that's my tangent line. That's what we actually want. And what you might notice here is that these two lines are really pointing in very different directions. So the slope of the green secant line is probably not going to be very close to the slope of the purple tangent line. But as I continue choosing points, as I move the two points closer together, you'll see that they're going to start lining up. But for right now, I decided to choose the point uh, x equals 4. So what's my slope? Well, my slope is my change in y over change in x. So that's going to be my y values are 0 and 3, so 0 minus 3. And my x values are 4 and 1, so 4 minus 1. So that's going to be negative 1. So that's the slope between those two points. All right, now moving on, let's pick another point and let's pick them to be uh, pick it to be closer. So in this case, I chose x equals 2 and a half. And again, you notice that the tangent line that I'm actually looking for, they're getting closer. It's still not quite exactly what I want, but it's getting better. And that's the process that we're trying to notice here. So my slope, uh, I'll write it a different way this time. Let's write it as y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. Same calculation, just a different way of writing it. So my two y values are 3.75 and 3, and my two x values are 2.5 and 1. And when we work that out, that works out to be positive 0.5. So that's the slope of the green dotted line, that green secant line. 
and we're still trying to figure out the slope of that purple tangent line. Now, the second point doesn't have to be to the right of the original point. It could be to the left. In other words, we could pick a second x value that's close to our original x value, but less than that original x value. So this is just to illustrate that. We pick x equals 0.5. Again, notice that that green dotted line is pretty close. This is we're, we're getting better now. This is pretty close to that tangent line that we were looking for. So let's figure out our slope. It's going to be 1.75 minus 3 divided by 0.5 minus one, and that's going to work out to be about two and a half. So 2.5 is the slope of that green dashed line. So we're getting better. That line looks pretty close to the purple tangent line that we're shooting for. Still not quite there, but we're getting there. All right, let's get even closer. So this time I picked x equals 1.1. So we get 1.1 comma 3.19. That's what I get when I plug in f of 1.1 works out to be four times 1.1 minus 1.1 squared. And if you work that out, that's where I'm getting that 3.19. So all of these y values I'm getting by plugging into my original function, in case you were wondering that. Change in y over change in x, 3.19 minus 3 divided by 1.1 minus 1. That works out to be 1.9. So we can keep doing this. There's nothing stopping us from continuing to move these two points closer and closer and closer and closer together. The closer together the two points are, the closer our slope of our secant line is to the slope of the tangent line that we really want. And at this point, we're kind of guessing, right? Do, do we exactly know what the slope of that purple line is? No, not yet, right? We're thinking that as we're getting closer, these are better approximations as we go down. And so maybe the slope is 1.9, maybe the slope is two, maybe it's somewhere in that neighborhood. We don't exactly know yet. We would have to do some more investigation to really figure out uh, an educated guess for what that slope would be. Now, what we're really doing here, again, it's the change in y over change in x. So what are my two y values? Well, my one y value is f of one, in other words, three. And the other y value is f of the x value that I chose. So that's the other y value. And then on the bottom of my fraction is one, that's my original x value, and this x here is the x value that I chose. So it really is f of x minus f of one, that's really my delta y. And then on the bottom, x minus one, that's my delta x. So that's the form that this computation is always going to take, regardless of what function we're looking at. So we need to look at what's happening to that slope. What's happening to that fraction, f of x minus f of one divided by x minus one. That fraction, by the way, is sometimes called a difference quotient. It's a quotient, quotient's just a fancy name for a fraction, and difference just means it's a fraction that has subtraction in it. So it's a subtraction on the top, subtraction on the bottom, so the fancy name for that is called a difference quotient. So you may see that phrase uh, kicking around as you continue your studies of calculus. So if we want x to be getting closer and closer and closer to one and think about what's happening, that's exactly a limit. And if you've been watching other videos in this series, you've seen uh, the limits that we've been talking about. And this is exactly what we need limits for. This is sort of the reason why we care about limits is we want to figure out what happens as x gets closer to one. That's what that says. When we say lim x arrow one, this says what happens as x gets closer to one. One. What happens to that fraction? That's the question that we're trying to answer. And if we can figure out the answer to that question, we have figured out the slope of the tangent line, which is the derivative that we've been talking about. So in general, we can do this for any function, right? So it doesn't have to be one as my starting x value. It can be any x value, which I'll just call a. So a is whatever your starting x value is. And so the derivative, which we sometimes write f prime of a, so this is just notation for the derivative of f of x at a is this limit, right? So the limit means what happens to this difference quotient, what happens to this fraction as x gets closer to a. So for now, we're gonna keep figuring that out using tables of values, right? We're gonna keep picking a second x value that's close to the a that we started with. And the closer we pick that second x value, the better that approximation will be. We also know some things about how to evaluate limits. So we can try to bring those skills to bear and see if we can use those skills to maybe even exactly figure out what that derivative is. And then eventually, and some of you might already know about some of these, eventually we're going to learn some shortcuts for evaluating derivatives of certain kinds of functions. 
So that's where we're going, right? We're still really early in our studies of calculus at this point, but the idea of the derivative and what the derivative is all about is pretty fundamental. So hopefully this video helped you make some sense out of those ideas.